Marsh. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm excited to have Sean Cooper today on the call. Uh, for those of you who don't know Sean, he bought his first home at the age of 27 and famously paid it off in three years at the age of 30. Uh, Sean is very popular in Canada. He wrote a best-selling book about uh, his, uh, his mortgage uh, titled Born Your Mortgage. Sean has an amazing story and we're going to dig into some of that today. He's a freelance writer, he's a mortgage broker, and he's had regular appearances on national TV and radio stations such as BNN, CBC, CTV, Global, and New Stop 1010. So Sean, looks like you're everywhere. I try uh, my so best. <laughs> <laughs> so Sean has been busy sharing his amazing story, he's written many, many articles uh, that has been featured in many publications such as Toronto Star, Global Mail, Financial Post and Money Sense. And now Sean is dedicated to helping others uh, with all things money related, especially with their biggest investment in their life, their mortgage. Uh, welcome Sean, I'm delighted to have you on the call uh, today. Um, Again, thanks so much for the great introduction. It's a pleasure to speak with you and look forward to um, sharing some of my wisdom with your audience today. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So why don't we start uh, uh, with your money story? Uh, what got you so motivated at a very early age to, to pay off your mortgage, to chase financial freedom? Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Well, Ken, that's a great question. Uh, I don't want to spoil all the details because my book goes into great detail in, in terms of that, but I'll kind of give your uh, listeners a bit of a uh, sneak peek in terms of that. So uh, for me, like growing up, my parents were always homeowners and uh, like they kind of instilled the importance of homeownership in me at a young age by just setting that good example. So I always knew that I wanted to be a homeowner and that was like you know, perhaps people when the kids when they were younger, they wanted to be like an astronaut or a ballerina or a wrestler. But I want, I knew I wanted to own a house. As lame as that uh, ambition was, but uh, anyhow, like even when I got my first job, I started saving towards like uh, down payment for a property, and uh, by just basically getting in that habit of saving money regularly uh, over the years. Uh, ever since I had my first job, I was able to save up a sizable down payment and buy a, um, a detached house in Toronto. Uh, you could buy a detached house in Toronto on your own back in 2012. Certainly prices have changed since then, but you know, I certainly think the dream of home ownership is uh, alive and well. You just kind of have to be strategic and smart about it. So I ended up buying my property and I, I knew that I didn't want to have a mortgage for the next 30 years because like growing up by when my parents split up my mother uh struggled to pay the mortgage on mm. a couple occasions like when she lost her job during the dot-com bubble as well as during the financial crisis so i didn't want to find myself in a similar situation so i basically set a plan to pay off my mortgage as quickly as possible and lo and behold i was able to do it in uh, three years time and i had a big mortgage burning party to celebrate that was covered on cbc so that was pretty cool, but uh, yeah, the main reason I did it was to help inspire other Canadians and show them that the dream of home ownership is still alive and well. You just have to be smart about it. So yeah, that's kind of my story in a nutshell, but if you want all the details, you'll just have to check out my book. That's right, that's right. Uh, yeah, so I read I read uh, part of your book. I think is is amazing the way, uh, the way you tackled that challenge, because I think it's, it's very challenging. I mean, I've owned, I've owned a home for, for a long time. It's so challenging. I still have mortgage on, on my home and I have lots and lots of mortgages. Uh, but it's so challenging to pay off your mortgage. Uh, but for you to do it in three years, that is so short. And I mean, if you bought your house in 2012, I don't think houses are not that cheap, uh, particularly in Toronto in 2012. Um, so uh, why don't you tell us a little bit how you achieved that? Uh, I mean, you don't have to go into a lot of details, but what did it take for you to pay off mortgages that is in hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, I think, in three short years? Sure. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to lie anything like that. It definitely was uh, hard work and took a lot of 
sacrifices, but I kind of saw it as a short-term pain for a long-term gain by working hard for those uh, three years to get my mortgage paid off. I could enjoy a lifetime of financial freedom. So since paying off my mortgage, I've been able to start my own business as a mortgage broker and do many trips without feeling guilty. Uh, unfortunately, during, due to COVID-19, there's not going to be any traveling anytime soon. But uh, yeah, like in terms of these sacrifices, uh, how I actually did it, like I'm not, um, I'm not related to, um, I'm not related to anyone wealthy. I don't have the trust account the size of Paris Hilton. It's one of the jokes I say in my book there. But uh, it was just, and my parents didn't give me any money towards my down payment because. Uh, they were the financial position to do that and I wouldn't want to accept like gift from them. So uh, basically I did it by um, one uh, living frugally during that time. So uh, there are some exaggerations in terms of my story. Like if you watch the story on CBC, it makes it seem like an ate craft dinner at every meal, which certainly wasn't the case. Maybe I ate it once a week, but I didn't eat it at every meal. So there's some, definitely some exaggerations out there, but yeah, living frugally, basically watching my spending in terms of food and transportation and um, also like not really taking any extravagant trips during that time, just waiting till I pay off my mortgage to celebrate and then take some better trips. And also um, in terms of the income side, like I had my full-time job and that was all right. But um, in order to pay off my mortgage, uh, I basically developed several side hustles and worked as like a, a money coach, a financial journalist, and worked part-time at a supermarket for uh, several years, uh, pretty much de a decade doing that. So by having all those extra, uh, all that extra money coming in, I could basically use my full-time job to make the regular mortgage payments. And then with the side hustle money, like when I would get a check for like one or $2,000, I would just make lump sum payments against the mortgage and oh, wow. with those lump sum payments they go 100% towards principal so you know when you see $2,000 uh, knocked off the mortgage balance it's uh, pretty motivating so once I saw how quickly I could get it paid down I just kept just like I can keep working hard and I just kept doing it and just watched the number go down and down and down and then like somebody from the financial post interviewed me and I paid off half my mortgage and then I said you know I'm gonna aim to pay it off in the next year and a half so when I said that in the financial post I kind of have to I, I, would, I would look like um, you know I would look like a, I don't know like I wouldn't look very good if I didn't pay it off in a year and a half no, like I said that I was going to so that just motivated me to work that much harder and yeah, I was able to pay it off in uh, three years. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, how I was able to do it by uh, going on the defense by reducing my expenses and going on the offense by increasing my income through the side hustle and uh, renting out uh, part of my house. I lo lived in the basement and rented out the upstairs uh, uh, because I could get more money for the upstairs and I was living that's on right. my own. So that's really how I was able to uh, do it, Ken. Oh, wow, wonderful, wonderful. So that's a typical uh, house hacking. And that's yes. one of the things I always recommend to some of my clients to, to always consider renting part of your home. Uh, I mean, I personally, I still rent part of my home. Uh, and I think that's something everyone should be doing uh, to get the additional, additional income. Um, so, I mean, it's interesting you, you brought up that point in terms of focusing on escalating your income and just reducing your expenses. Uh, recently, I wrote an article on, on what I call the gap. Uh, for many years myself, I think I uh, I focused on the income part and didn't pay a lot of attention to the expenses side. Uh, but I think if you want to maximize your gap, uh, you need to pay attention to the expenses. So gap is something I define as income minus expenses. Right, and so uh, you tackled it just looking at, you looked at all those variables in that equation, um, working a lot harder to generate more income and focusing on minimizing your expenses. Um, so what, what are some of the challenges in doing that? I know sometimes uh, a lot of people can get very easy wins just by eliminating expenses, but it's hard for us to do. Uh, I, I certainly struggled with that. So what are some of the challenges uh, that are holding people back from focusing more on their expenses. Um, in terms of myself, I was able to pay off my mortgage in three years by age 30, but I don't think that necessarily makes sense for a lot of Canadians or um, is achievable for a lot of Canadians and, um, you know, 
I'm not sure a lot of people would want to make those sacrifices. Like I didn't name my book, How to Pay Off Your Mortgage in Three Years by age 30. I think my book's called Burn Your Mortgage. So basically whatever pace it makes sense to pay off your mortgage, whether it's 25 years, 20 years, or 15 years, um, you know, feel free to pick the pace that makes the most sense for you and fits with your lifestyle. But in terms of the challenges that Canadians face in terms of cutting back in expenses, like in my personal situation, I was living on my own. I didn't have like a spouse or family. So uh, I was a lot more nimble in terms of uh, I could choose my own expenses and things to cut off, cut, cut, cut back on. But if I had like a family, I think it would be a lot more challenging. You like, you can't just say to your whole family, like, we're giving up the car and everyone needs to walk from out on like i definitely don't think that's realistic for all the canadians but definitely you can look i definitely think that canadians like um their financial situations are all different but that doesn't mean that save money like you can kind of look for small wins and you know regardless of that like all canadians spend money on groceries i definitely think that there's like ways to save money on food expenses, uh, you know, buying bulk on, and in sale, uh, on sale, like you don't have to eat half a craft dinner diet or anything like that. You can just be smarter with your spending in, in terms of that and try to buy things more on sale. And uh, in terms of like um, spending, like with Canada moving closer and closer to a cashless society, especially with COVID-19, like people just don't want to use cash right now. Um, they're just afraid to touch cash like with that push towards the castle society um it, it has some benefits but it also has some um downsides as well and i think the biggest downside is that um there's less studies have, have shown that there's uh like less pain of spending when you spend with a credit card versus like cash so um that can really put canadians in, in debt so i just think kind of doing a better job of monitoring your spending and holding yourself accountable whether it's logging into your credit card um, account once a week or once a day, whatever works well for you, just kind of keeping track of all those expenses. And an another thing is those automated, like everyone seems to, all these different accounts like Amazon Prime, Netflix, they all seem to want like $10 a month. And you know, $10 a month may not seem like a, a lot, but you know, when you have like 15 of them, it, it adds up to a lot of money. So there's a term for, uh, all those different subscription um, payments. It's called subscription creep. So I would just say review your credit card uh, statement carefully and just look for those like recurring expenses. And if you're still like signed up for Amazon Prime and you're not using it to its full benefit, do you really need to be spending that amount of money? Or even with like internet and cable, like if you have the deluxe internet and cable plan and you're not watching like 90% of the channels and if with the internet if you like you know you're signed up for a top tier plan but you really don't need that high speed and you're barely using any of the bandwidth like um, you know reviewing it you could perhaps downgrade the plans and save yourself a lot of money over the long term so I would just say scrutinizing the expenses how you're spending money um, that would be a good start for a lot of Canadians like so you don't you don't need to give up your car and everything that you love. I mean, that would definitely help, but uh, I just think you have to be smarter with your spending and, and try to help hold yourself more accountable if, if that makes sense. That's right, that's right. No, I totally agree with you. I, I think uh, I think I personally have suffered from the subscription script, uh, creep myself, uh, uh, having a hard time. So what I did recently, even with this COVID, I had to just close my credit card account and said, okay, if there is anything, they will call me. <laughs> so and then I'll make a decision if I need it or not. So that's uh, that's one other thing I suggested to people. What just cancel or call your bank. So change my credit card. And um, if if you're having a hard time trying to cancel some of your subscriptions, uh, so that's excellent. Uh, so there's this movement now on financial freedom (FI). Uh, in some cases, I think they call it FIRE, uh, financial yes. independence, and retire early. Uh, so you certainly have achieved financial independence. Um, do you want to define that? I, I think that can be confusing to a lot of people. Uh, do you want to quickly talk a little bit about what financial independence means? Yes. Uh, did you want me to talk about financial independence or the, the FIRE movement or both? Uh, both, if you can. Sure. So I actually had the uh, 
pleasure and honor of speaking at the, uh, there was like a Mr. Money Mustache gathering last uh, summer. And if you're not familiar with him, basically somebody who's uh, like uh, in, in favor of frugal living and achieving financial independence. So I got to speak at this uh, event last year and with a bunch of other people that were uh, fans of financial independence. And, you know, the, the term of financial independence, I guess they're people, different people uh, define it in, in different ways, but I kind of see it as um, not, basically you can choose to work, but you don't have to, you have all your basic expenses paid for, like your the roof over your head and food and transportation and you have all that stuff covered and you don't need to work if you don't want to you're able to live off your investment so that's kind of the way that i see financial independence and um like with the retire earlies i'm sure people have read stories online where you know people don't wait till 65 to retire they might choose to retire at like 35 instead or some early age like that and uh, i just find I, I don't know people's definition of retirement i guess is different because I see a lot of the people that uh, like live the fire lifestyle they don't actually fully retire like they still have side hustles that they do but perhaps their definition of retirement is just leaving their like full-time nine-to-five job and just doing more passion projects that uh, they enjoy and, and pay the bills so that's kind of my definition of uh, fire I guess everyone's definition is uh, different but that's you know in, in a nutshell that's how i would define it yeah I, and i think i totally agree uh with with your definition so it, it certainly means different things to different people uh but at the end of the day it just gives you that freedom to uh to live the life you want to live without the burden of uh, a nine to five job or without the burden of having to deal with a huge uh, mortgage or expenses that you can't control um, so I totally, I totally agree with that. Um, so why don't you talk a little bit about uh, the real estate industry now that you are, I know you, you're very close to that industry now that you work as a mortgage advisor. Um, so you obviously believe that buying your own primary residence uh, is certainly instrumental for financial independence. Uh, is that a view that you share? Yes, I mean, um, you know, of, I would say for the majority of Canadians, uh, it does make sense to own a property, but, you know, it doesn't make sense for everyone. But certainly, I think uh, it was instrumental in me being able to achieve financial independence and makes sense for a lot of Canadians as well. Like, basically, the way that I see it is that, um, like, whether you uh, own a property or you rent a property, you have like these fixed expenses like so when you rent a property you have to keep paying rent and uh, the rent amount like um, goes up like usually your landlord raise the, raises the rent and um, you know sometimes your landlord might sell the property and uh, you might have to find a new property and pay more for rent but basically you have to just keep pay, like if you don't own a property you have to pay that rent indefinitely whereas when you're a homeowner there's certainly expenses that you have to keep paying like property taxes and uh, um, utilities and stuff like that. But once you get your mortgage paid off, that's like the single biggest uh, expense for owning a property. So like basically what I did once I had my mortgage paid off, I redirected that cash flow to my like tax-free savings account and my RSP and I've been able to like get caught up on those contributions and maximize them every single year. So, you know, some people take a more balanced approach. They the extra money they might put towards their RSP or TFSA or split it between like extra payments with their mortgage or RSP TFSA it you know it depends on your financial um, situation and uh, what matters most to you but um, yeah I mean there's not one size fits all answer but uh, yeah I would definitely say for a lot of Canadians uh, like for myself like owning a property was instrumental in achieving financial independence and uh, I would say that, you know, it can help a lot of Canadians as well. You just kind of need to be smart about it. And I picked a property that's uh, like a, a plan to and have stayed here long term. I've been at the same property for eight years. Like if, if real estate is help, helpful to build wealth, but if you're going to be 
moving every two to three years, um, you know, it makes it kind of hard to make uh, those gains off of real estate because there's the transactional cost of real estate, like the land transfer tax is a real big thing. Um, so I would generally say like, if you're buying a property, uh, it's a good idea to kind of uh, have a plan to stay put for at least like five, five to 10 years, at least five years at a minimum. And, and that way um, you can kind of minimize the transactional cost. But yeah, I would definitely say you can achieve financial independence uh, other ways. Like I have friends where uh, they achieve financial independence and they haven't uh, owned a property, but those friends travel around the world and stay in like parts of Asia where the cost of living is, is cheap. I mean, I'm, it makes sense for them, but I don't think the vast majority of Canadians would want to do that. So for people that want to stay in Canada and you know, don't necessarily want to move out to you know the Maritimes or the Prairies or somewhere like where the cost of living is, is cheaper, like people who want, kind of want to save in the city, like stay in the city, um, you know, I think kind of the strategy of uh, owning your primary residence and paying it off uh, makes a lot of sense and can help you uh, reach financial independence if that's a goal that you'd like to achieve. That's right. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I think that makes uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, so now for, I, I know you were able to burn your mortgage in three years. Um, I think it's a little bit more challenging now with the kind of markets we have in Toronto and in the greater Toronto area where house prices are, are significantly higher. Uh, so when you talk to your clients uh, now, uh, do you still have a strategy or work with them in terms of coming up with a strategy to pay off their mortgage in, in let's say five, 10 years, 15 years? Uh, how challenging is it for them to, or how easy is it for them to get into uh, real estate ownership, uh, particularly in, in the times that we live here in Toronto? Sure. Well, I, because it depends on the client that I'm working with. Some clients want to pay off their mortgage quickly. Other clients have a different strategy. Like for them, they want to own several properties similar to yourself. Uh, can they want to like own rental properties? So for them, like paying off their primary residence uh, might not make sense. So um, it all depends on the clients. Um, and yeah, I definitely you know, if, if clients are interested in paying off the mortgage sooner, uh, I definitely can go over some strategies in terms of doing that, like lump sum payments, increasing your payments, uh, and helping them choose a lender that has flexible prepayments so they, they can pay down their mortgage uh, faster. And in terms of getting into the real estate market, like, um, yeah, it certainly is more challenging these days with the higher home prices. Uh, the wages have definitely not kept up with the appreciation of home prices, but, um, I would just say the most important thing is to get your foot in the door and start building up equity in, in the real estate market. So you, you may not be able to afford a detach, detached house right away, but um, you know perhaps you can afford a condo or townhouse and by owning that property, you can start building up uh, equity. And yeah, I totally get it. Like buying a property on your own is challenging in a big city like Toronto or Vancouver, uh, but you just have to kind of get creative about it. Like I was able to get into the market because I saved up a sizable down payment by working really hard. Other options that I help my clients with, um, they can have like, if their parents are able to gift them money towards the down payment, that can help. Mm -hmm. Another thing that can help is having like a parent uh, as a uh, guarantor or as a co-applicant or co-signer and in situations like that, we can use their parents' income to help qualify for a mortgage, uh, okay. uh, for the mortgage. So yeah, they're definitely, you know, uh, when I speak with clients, they just kind of want to understand what they would like to uh, achieve in terms of real estate, like what their ideal purchase price is. And, you know, if they're, if they're working at like part-time at a supermarket and they want to buy a $2 million house, I hate to <laughs> burst their bubble, but that's not possible. But, um, you know, if, if their home buying ambitions are realistic and kind of like to figure out a way to help them get there, whether it's having a parent co-signing or renting out part of, of the property, like uh, okay. yeah, I'm kind of here to support them and just kind of help them get their foot in the door and building up equity. So I would say that's kind of the most instrumental part. Like, you know, when I was trying to buy a home, I'd read all these articles on the internet that would say, oh, a big housing crash is coming. Like real estate's overvalued. Uh, 
just you know wait and the home prices will come down but uh you know i since since 2012 like even during this pan pandemic like the home prices maybe the home sales have come down but i'm we're still seeing multiple offers out there so if i had to just like listen to the experts and sat on the sidelines in 2012 and did nothing i would have been kicking myself because I, I, you know i couldn't have afforded a house day and age so i would just say you know buy property and want to make sense to, to uh for you uh you know don't don't you know certainly it, it makes sense of all the news but don't uh you know don't listen to too many of these uh people who are um you know bearish in the housing market because you know they're they're bound to be right eventually but some of these people just you know that's kind of their i guess uh mo they just like being negative on housing for whatever reason um and you know they're bound to be right eventually if they say there's gonna be a housing crash if they say it every single year for 20 years they're gonna be right eventually so i would just say you know even if there's a housing crash like buying real estate's a long-term investment like if you hold on to the property long term uh, the chances are pretty good that you'll uh, make money so uh, yeah I would just say you know buy a house when it makes sense uh, for you and just kind of try to tune out those negative people um, in, in terms of real estate because they're probably just saying that just to get on TV or something like that because they um, <laughs> that's kind of their I guess the stick or, or whatnot. Yeah, wonderful. I think you've made some very good, important points there uh, that people need to get in early. Uh, staying on the sideline uh, is probably not going to be helpful. Uh, you, you made a point that real estate is a long-term game, right? So it's a long-term plan. So plan to buy and plan to hold on for at least five years, maybe 10 years, just to avoid all the transaction costs. Um, uh, sometimes just stay away from, from news. Uh, uh, this, this guys that, uh, that are bearish on the real estate market may not be helpful uh, in, in terms of when you're looking into buying. Uh, so those are, those are great points. Um, so if you work with young, um, I'm, I'm sort of concerned about very, the young people that are just graduating these days. Uh, how can they, it's, it's pretty challenging for young people coming into the workforce uh, with no savings. Uh, and dealing with the rising house prices. How do you work with young people and how, what do you advise them to do uh, for them to get in into the real estate market uh, as quickly as possible? I know you, you got in quite uh, early uh, at age 27. Um, so what, what advice do you have for young people these days in terms of getting into uh, real estate quite early? Sure. Well, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I mean, I, I do like looking at real estate with rose-colored glasses, but, you know, I want to be realistic as well. It's certainly not as easy as it used to be. And certainly when I was buying a property, it wasn't as easy as it was for my parents. Like, my parents were able to afford, like, pretty much a mansion in Toronto on, like, you know, just my father's income working at, like, Canada Post. So I think it's more challenging for every generation so i mean i but i would just say like you know don't get too overwhelmed like when somebody comes to me and they say that they want to own a property um, i just kind of and, and go through this exercise in, in my book like I, I work with them to set like a smart goal and smart is an acronym that stands for specific measurable attainable relevant and time bound and basically a smart goal like instead of saying i want to own a property one day you actually like figure out like I want to own a property like I want to own a townhouse in Toronto in three years and then you figure out well how much of a down payment do I want to save and then let's say you want to save like a $30,000 down payment then you figure out like okay that's $10,000 a year and then how much money would I need to save from each paycheck and then basically you automate those savings so whatever the amount is like let's say it's like $300 a, a paycheck, you have that money automatically come off the top and you put into a savings account. And so that way the money's out of sight, out of mind. And of course you don't want to be living paycheck to paycheck. And um, like, mm. you know, when you graduate, it can be like, uh, I guess there's gonna be a bit of peer pressure to go out and um, spend money and get a very, like rent a very like fancy place and get a brand new car and, uh, you know, you can take on a lot of debt that way, um, like by getting a car loan or, or lease, but, but just kind of living more modestly, like, you know, 
even considering living with roommates after you graduate, like if you don't want to do that, I understand, but at least, you know, don't be spending like $3,000 a month on rent. Like just kind of try to live more modestly. Like, I don't know, even living at home longer might help. That's right. That's so yeah, by not, you know, by not having like rents, the single biggest, uh, expense by not having you know by not spending like twenty five hundred dollars a month on rent or three thousand dollars a month on rent that's a lot of like money that you can free up to save towards a down payment so that would be my like biggest uh takeaway point uh from that just be careful with your spending and consider like continuing to live like a student after you graduate i mean you don't have to live uh on like ramen noodle or craft dinner diet <laughs> but uh you know just be careful with the big expenses like rent and uh a new vehicle and all that and uh you know by kind of being more financially disciplined you will have some extra money that you can put towards like saving towards an eventual property so that would be my biggest piece of advice for younger folks who want to own a property or even you know people who are first-time home buyers uh, as well who mm -hmm. might you know I've rented for many years. That would be my like piece of advice for them as well. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for that. I think that is uh, very very important uh, advice for for not just the young people, but I mean for every Canadian. Uh, I think uh, uh, the challenges with with household debt is is so, is, um, is so significant these days. Uh, people take on the buy too too big a house for themselves. Uh, buy expensive cars uh, it's so easy to get into debt these days and so that's why a lot of people are struggling struggling I have uh, three tips to give to our listeners today three tips that listeners can implement immediately um, on their path to financial independence or financial freedom what will those three tips be sure so you've put me a bit on the spot but I think I can come up with uh, three tips uh, have nine different ways to burn your mortgage in my book so um, three tips shouldn't be a problem so the first tip i would say is uh, i'll just repeat myself again briefly i would say set yourself goals and not only goals set yourself smart goals because um, by setting yourself goals and actually writing them down and holding yourself accountable like you don't have to have an interview with the financial post and tell them your goals to hold yourself accountable like you can maybe just tell your family or write it down on a piece of paper and Put it on the fridge uh but you know by actually setting those goals they can help motivate you and hold yourself accountable so i would say that's the uh first uh tip and uh the second tip would be um it definitely helps to buy real estate so just kind of come up with a game plan of when you want to own a property and uh, try to get in the housing market like sooner rather than, than later um of course when it makes sense for you but you know by getting into the real estate market early on, I was able to build up a lot of wealth and pay down my property sooner rather than, you know, listening to the people that were negative about the housing market. So, you know, I certainly think when it makes sense for you to own a property, like once you're committed to staying in a, in a certain like city or town long-term, then it can make sense to buy property. So um, look into that. And uh, also, you know, um, um, when shopping, I would say when shopping for a mortgage, like certainly a mortgage, the mortgage rate does matter, but don't get too fixated on that. There are other things that matter in terms of shopping for a mortgage, like for example, prepayment privileges, like the ability to pay down your mortgage sooner. If that's important to you, then mm. um, be sure to look into those because it's not the same with every single lender. And also mortgage penalties are important too, because uh, when you sign for a mortgage, a lot of Canadians like assume that they're going to stay in the property long term but then something happens in their life and they have to break the mortgage and some penalties can end up being more costly than others at other lenders so be sure to ask about the penalties and if you think there's a chance you could uh, break your mortgage then um, perhaps it might make sense to sign up for the lender who has uh, lower penalties so uh, yeah those would be my top three tips to have like I said I have nine different tips on burning your mortgage right. sooner but you know <laughs> these I'm just gonna share a you with your audience this evening they'll have to read my book if they want to know all of them all right excellent excellent and we will certainly provide a link to to where they can get your book uh, i i think that's an amazing book and that book is not just about burning your mortgage that book is all about achieving financial independence 
uh, so we'll make sure we'll put a link uh, uh, in the notes to this interview for people to get access to that book. Um, so thank you for those tips. I think uh, those tips are great. Uh, important for people to set goals. Uh, without goals, you can't do anything. Uh, but again, setting the goals and coming up with an implementation plan to achieve your goals. Uh, and I like the way you break down the implementation plan. All right. So if you have a goal that you want to achieve in three years, uh, breaking it down into annual goals, monthly goals, and even weekly and daily goals. Uh, so I think that is critical. Uh, secondly, you talked about getting into real estate early. Um, it's, it's always important for people to buy and get in very early. Uh, and that's something I advocate as well. Uh, I think real estate is a great way for people to achieve financial independence. And so that is a great tip. And finally, you, you talked about uh, looking closely uh, at your mortgage terms. Uh, I know a lot of people go into mortgage just looking at the rates, uh, but, but I think you, you make very good points here. Not just looking at the interest rates, but you have to look at prepayment privileges. You have to look at uh, penalties. Uh, so there are a bunch of other things you should be considering when you're looking at, uh, at a mortgage uh, for your property. So that's excellent. So why don't you talk a little bit about what you're doing these days to help Canadians? I know you're working as a mortgage uh, a mortgage broker. Um, I know you're also a freelance writer. So talk a little bit about how you've been helping or how you help Canadians uh, these days. Well, th thanks so much for having me on, on your show. And yeah, I'd be happy to talk um, what I'm doing these days. So it, it was never really my plan to become mortgage broker uh, but um, after I burned my mortgage papers uh, the story got so much attention in, in the media that I decided to write a book just to because uh, so many people were reaching out to me and asking me questions of how I did it so I decided to write a book and then after that like Canadians still kept reaching out to me asking for me advice in terms of their mortgage but I wasn't licensed to give advice because um, like while I did work in the financial industry for 10 years i was working in the pension industry i wasn't working with mortgages so by paying off my mortgage um, i was able to like feel comfortable like starting my own business as a mortgage broker because like you don't like with pensions i had a stable salary and that was helpful to pay down my mortgage but working as a mortgage broker like i'm essentially an entrepreneur so there's no gu guarantee in, in terms of salary so i was just able to by achieving financial independence i was able to make that move over and yeah, I've really enjoyed being a mortgage broker the last couple of years, um, hearing uh, the difference that I make in the lives of, of my clients and uh, just hearing their words of gratitude and you know hearing them say that I've helped uh, realize their dream of home ownership and put their, them in a better financial position, like makes me feel like happy that I was able to do that. And yeah, I look forward to helping plenty more uh, Canadians uh, achieve the dream of home ownership and you know just kind of hearing them say like you know I've never heard anyone at the bank say that before just trying to educate people and give them information about mortgages where they'll learn this up front like how penalties work and how prepayments work because um, you know a lot of people learn about penalties the hard way when they have to break their mortgage at one point in their lifetime but I kind of like educating people up front so that they can avoid kind of a bad experience where they have to pay like a, a huge penalty like that so yeah I really enjoyed helping the Canadians the last couple of years with their mortgage and uh, looking forward to helping Canadians for the years to come as well. Excellent excellent thank you and we're gonna put a link to, to your website uh, site as well. So uh, if Canadians are interested, I, I know a lot of people are motivated by listening and hearing your story today. And so if people are interested in reaching out to you, how can they get a hold of you? What's the best way for people to reach you? Sure. So the best way to reach me is that you can phone me at 647-867-3711. You can visit my website, burnyourmortgage.ca. That's burnyourmortgage.ca, all one word. And I have a free newsletter there. And I also have a podcast that I try to uh, release on like a uh, every couple of weeks there. I've done 70 episodes so far and uh, it's all about real estate and mortgages. So I think that your listeners would find that uh, interesting. And uh, also you can 
If you like to reach me by email, you can email me at sean at burnyourmortgage.ca and I offer free mortgage consultation. So if you have any questions about mortgages or real estate, feel free to reach out and uh, happy to uh, chat with you free of charge. Okay, excellent, excellent. All right, thank you, Sean. So we're gonna put the notes to all of those contact information and the notes to this call. So thank you, Sean, for for making the time to share your story. I really, really appreciate it. It, it is an amazing story. And thank you that you're continuing to, to work hard to help many Canadians as you can uh, get onto uh, financial independence as well. So thank you, thank you. Well, my pleasure. I think it's uh, great work that you're doing on your end as well um, in terms of Canadians uh, with your business too. So uh, looking forward to helping Canadians, uh, both of us together. So thanks again for having me on your show. Yeah, excellent. Thank you.